like the Monty Python boys say, and now for something completely different. Even though it's not actually completely different, just like in Monty Python. So uh, just as a quick beginning, there's a reference. Um, there's a lot of people who talk about this stuff. It's in concise. It's in a lot of places. But the one place I found with all of the proofs and definitions that I'm doing today and also tomorrow morning is uh, Ranitsky's Uh, algebraic and geometric surgery. And this is uh, chapters two and six. Um, and it just it has it's much more detailed than most of the other references I found on this stuff. So that's a good place to start. Okay, so let's talk about cobordism. That's what we're talking about for the next bunch of lectures. And what is cobordism? Well, we have two manifolds. We'll just start with the definition, and then we can start drawing pretty pictures. So two manifolds, uh, M and N, are cobordant if there exists a manifold W such that the boundary of W is the disjoint union of M and N. And then I'm also going to put mumble, mumble here, and then I'm going to mumble about it. So the mumbling is, this is really unoriented cobordism. I'm not worrying about any structures on the manifolds. So they are just topological manifolds. But a lot of the time, you, don't, you care about other structures. You want smooth structures. You want complex structures. You want orient, orientations. You want stuff on the manifold. And then you can say two stuffy manifolds are coordinate. There exists a stuffy manifold, W, such that this and the boundary preserves whatever stuff you care about. So for example, with, if you wanted orientation, then you need this to be M to show union negative N. And if you want, you know, framed or something like that, which is what we're going to be talking about later, then you want W to have the same kind of structure that restricts correctly to the two structures on M and N. So you're allowed to put other structure on, and then the point is that the entire definition has to carry the structure. Um, but the basic outline of the definition is the same no matter what kind of cobordism that you're doing. Um, so that's that. So let's, let's do a couple of examples. Um, oh. Yes, mostly, usually this is done with everything being compact. Um, and in fact, M and N generally need to be closed because if you want them to be the boundary of something and you don't want to deal with manifolds with corners, then M and N have to be closed. But in fact, some people do want to do manifolds with corners. So mumble, 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 stuff that you want, you put it in there and you make the definition look like that, um, whichever way you like to do it. OK, and uh, just as a notation, Thing, uh, we'll write W, M, N for a cobordism. Because, for example, let's, let's do some examples. Uh, so first off, first important example, if M is just the boundary of something, then M and empty set are cobordant. By the way, why is it called cobordism and cobordant? Well, uh, board is the French word for boundary. And so together, they are the boundary, cobordant. The co means together. It is not the same kind of co that you are usually dealing with. And so, but in fact, these turn out to be cohomology theories. So sometimes people use cobordism and bordism to mean the homology and co the cohomology and homology theory that you get from cobordism. So most of the time, you say bordism and you say cobordism, and they mean the same thing. But sometimes they mean dual things. So uh, I am only going to be using the word cobordism. The word bordism will not appear in these talks. But when you are talking to people, you should be. You should ask what they're talking about if you are not 100% certain. Um, OK, so there it is. And 
just by, you know, W, M, empty set. And then another example is M is cobordant, cobordant to itself because we can take W to be M cross I. And then the cobordism is W, M, M. But also, another example, M disjoint union M is cobordant to the empty set by the first thing. And if you think of this as a cylinder standing up with, you know, M on the bottom and M on the top, we often will think of this as a, as a cylinder twisted around like this with M and M on the bottom and the empty set on the top. But this is why uh, for cobordism you need W and M and M because you need to know W is a relation between two things and those two things are not generally uniquely defined by W. Also notice that there's lots of ways for something to be cobordant to itself. Here's another cobordism between M and M, at least for this particular picture. There we go. All we care about is the boundary. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in there. Okay, let's let's do. Maybe it's worth emphasizing right away that as soon as you get stuck in uh -huh. three fails, uh, three, fails. three fails, two works just fine. If you add a, everything. A, a, cobordism is an equivalence relation, so M had better be cobordant to itself. Um, yeah, but three fails. Yes, three fail. Three is just in this example. Yeah, once you have orientation, uh, M disjoint union M with the opposite orientation is cobordant to the empty set by this picture, for instance. But M plus M is not cobordant to the empty set. Say that again. What? Depends on, if we're only doing compact stuff, then no. Um, but otherwise, generally, yes. And you will see in a second. I'm going to construct a bunch of examples. OK, so three. And this is just so that I can draw a picture. Here's a specific uh, cobordism. Four, thank you. Uh, this is a pair of pants. And it shows that one circle is cobordant to two circles. And in fact, if you want to dress an alien with M minus one arms, a head, and N legs in a onesie, you see that M circles are cobordant to N circles. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you dress it. And there we go. <laughs> so, all numbers of circles, <laughs> thank you. So, all numbers of circles are cobordant to one another. And of course, if the alien had no arms or head, then n circles are cobordant to nothing. So, uh, circles are kind of silly in a certain sense in terms of cobordism. But there we go, specific example. OK, Sli getting slightly more formal. Suppose that you have a cobordism W from M to N. And you have another cobordism W prime from N to P. Then you can compose these. So I'm going to draw it as cylinders, but you can see how this works. You have a cylinder here and a cylinder here. And, they, and this, so this is N and this is N. So you can just glue them together at N to produce a really long cylinder. So these together produce, so you take the union of W with W prime along N, and that is a cobordism from M to P. Now in the mumble, mumble, mumble situation, you need the mumble, mumble, mumble data to agree near N. So the 
when you do this, you don't just need the ends to be the same as manifolds, you need the ends to be the same as mumble, mumble, mumble manifolds. And then you can glue them together properly. Yes? Say that again, what? Which cobordism? So whenever you have smooth stuff, the cobordism, you have a little bit of extra data that you have a collar neighborhood of the boundary, and then the collar neighborhood glues together, the two collar neighborhoods glue, glue together smoothly. So this is actually sort of part of what you want in the definition. If this doesn't work, that means your definition is off, and you put a little bit more mumbling before your W. So this, this is important. This is, this is a big important example. So I'll put stars next to the big important examples. If these two examples don't work, then you are doing something wrong. Sometimes you want the other examples to not work correctly always, but those two examples, if they don't work, you're just doing something wrong. So you need to change the mumbling in your definition. Okay, here's a very cool example. Six, thank you. I did, in fact, have two threes in my notes. That's why I'm messing it up. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so suppose that M is a, is a manifold and we have an embedding from SP cross DQ into M. So there's an observation here which is quite important. The boundary of SP cross DQ, well, how do you take the boundary of a product in general? You take the boundary here and cross it with what you get here, and then you take the union of that with this cross the boundary here. This has no boundary, so one of those, one of those things that you're unioning is empty. So the boundary of this is SP cross SQ minus 1, and this is the same as the boundary of DP plus 1 cross SQ minus 1. So we have an SP cross DQ sitting inside M. We can cut its interior out, and instead of it, we can glue in a DP plus 1 cross SQ minus 1, because they have the same boundary. So we can cut out uh, the interior of SP cross DQ and glue in S. Uh, dp plus 1 cross sq minus 1 along boundary. Now, this is related to handle attachment. If you've seen handle attachment, this might look kind of similar. It's not the same thing. It just looks similar, and they are very closely related. If you haven't seen handle attachment, ignore what I just said. So I'm going to draw a couple of examples of this just so you can see how it works. So... Uh, when, so, sorry, M is an N manifold and you need P plus Q to equal M. Because otherwise this doesn't work properly. In that it doesn't produce a manifold. You want it to keep produce, you want, if M is a closed manifold, you want it to still be a closed manifold at the end. And if it's not N, then it doesn't work properly. Okay, so let's look at the case N equals 1. So M is a circle. And we have no choice, well, we really have no choice about what P and Q are because D0 is boring. And so we want to take S0 cross D1. So we have S0 cross D1, which is something like this. It's two little segments inside M. And now we cut them out to produce two lobes like this. And we're going to glue in uh, well D1 cross S0. So we're really just gluing back two segments. And there's two ways to do this. We can just glue it back in the way it was before, and then we produce the same thing that we had before, which is kind of boring. Or we can glue them together like this, and then we get two circles. And so 
We started off with one circle. We did a surgery. This is called surgery, by the way. And we get two circles. Notice these two things are cobordant. OK, now let's do a slightly more interesting example. Uh-huh. Boundary of a manifold of, no. Um, I mean, think about the Klein bottle. It's not the boundary of anything. Um, Klein bottle's not the boundary of anything. But you can't. Yeah, you can't fill it. It has no outside or inside. No, um, when you're before you identify, you have to fill in this. You want to do this. That's correct. If you fill the cylinder, then you fill the entire outside too, because the inside becomes the outside. Um, it really isn't the boundary of anything, really. Um, and, okay, so let's do something more interesting. Let's do n equals 2. So uh, I'm not doing anything with tori because the, the drawing is going to get messy, so I'm only going to do this first sphere. So m is going to be s2. And now we have two possibilities. We can do s0 cross d2, or we can do s1 cross d1. So I'm going to do both of these. S1 0 cross D2 is two caps. So here is my M. And here is my S0 cross D2. So it's a cap over here. And it's a cap over here. So now I cut them out. And I produce a cylinder. That's what's left. And now I'm gluing in uh, and I'm going to get this messed up. I'm going to glue in a D1 cross S1. And so what's that? That's uh, the inside of a cylinder. And so, no. Yes? Yeah, 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 that's the inside of the cylinder. So then, yeah, that's correct. So you, here is my D1 cross S1. I'm gluing in along here. And you see you get a torus. But I actually had a choice here. When I draw, when I draw this torus, I say, oh, I'm going to choose the, the two orientations along which I glue to these circles. I'm going to choose them to be the same orientation. And that gives you a circle. Or get, that gives you a torus. Alternately, I could have chosen opposite orientations. There's no reason why I had to choose the same one. And that'll give you a Klein bottle. Um, no. Oh, it does. The torus is a boundary, so. So RP2 is not yet. That's a good point. Okay. Huh. The Klein bottle is. What's the boundary of. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so we can figure it out later. That's weird. Um, it is weird. It's, okay, so now let's do S1 cross D1. S1 cross D1 is exactly this kind of cylinder thing. So when we cut it out, we're going to cut out sort of what's left the black part here. So we start with a circle, with a sphere again. And then we cut out the middle part now. So again, we have these two circles, but we're now cutting out the middle part. And so we're left with two caps, like that. And now uh, we need to glue in S0 cross D2. And really, there's only one way to do that. You have to close this up and then close this up. So 
So now you get two spheres. So ah, there it is. OK, so these are the kinds of things that surgery can do. It can turn a sphere into two spheres. It can turn a sphere into a torus or a Klein bottle. And you can do this in all dimensions and any kinds of manifolds and produce a bunch of things. And now, the point of this example, given that we were talking about cobordism, is that if m and m prime are related <coughs> by a surgery, then they are cobordant. And how does this work? Um, we're going to take W to be M cross I. So let's say that the surgery is on uh, SP cross DQ. Um, so then we're going to take the union. This is going to include into SP cross DQ cross 1. So we, have this, we take the cylinder M cross I, and on the bottom it's going to stay M, because that's what we want. And on the top, we want it to turn into M prime. So what we're going to do is we're going to attach a handle to it. So over here, it's going into M cross 1 the way that it would um, the way that it would in terms of uh, into, uh, into M. And over here, it's going into it as part of the boundary. And then what it's doing is that it's changing the boundary exactly by the surgery. And you can check that. It's an exercise. Check that that works. So what you need to check to prove this is that the top actually produces M prime. But it does. So this is called the trace of the surgery. So last time, I said that algebraic topologists like things because like invariants that we can compute and figure stuff out with. So what we've just done is that we've said that, look, two things are cobordant if there's a surgery from one to the other. There's actually a moreover part. And this requires some Morse theory, so we are not going to do it. But you should go and look it up in the book. It's very nice and very pretty. Uh, any cobordism is a composition of traces. So what you can do is you can, you have a cobordism, which is like a cylinder. You can slice it up vertically into a composition of things in such a way that each one is the trace of a surgery. So all cobordisms can be classified through surgeries. And how does what relate to that? Uh, you need surgery with stuff that I don't fully understand. I think there's a more general version of this, but I don't fully, I don't fully know it. I'm not an expert on surgery theory. It's not completely general. It works for oriented, unoriented, and I think some nice, like I think complex it might work with. But you, need, you end up with stuff surgery. Like oriented surgery still makes perfect sense. You need stuff surgery, and some of it I think doesn't make sense. But as I said, I'm not an expert on surgery theory, so I don't know the complete answer to that. Um, the problem with going in this direction is that actually cobordism is not that hard to compute, as we will be discussing tomorrow, whereas surgery is really hard to compute. So in fact, usually the classification goes the other way. Two things are related by a sequence of surgeries if they are cobordant. But this is, uh, this is a nice bijection between sort of much more geometric things and more topological things as we are about to get into. But I want to point out, because this is, a, this is a very important thing that it's related to, and I wanted to point it out. OK, so these are examples. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in, in learning more about this moreover, it's in Ranitsky, uh chapter 2. Um, Morse theory is not very difficult. It's just, you know, I only have 
45 minutes at most left, and it would take about 30 of those minutes. So we're going to go on and just tell you that is interesting stuff to look up. Um, the trace is this cobordism. Okay, so really I just said, oh look, there's this thing that we can classify with cobordism. So this is a justification about why cobordism is interesting. This is not really a way to figure out anything that we can learn about cobordism. Um, actually, that's actually true in a lot of ways. Cobordism is usually the tool that you use to learn about things rather than the other way around. So now I'm going to relate cobordism to another thing that we want to know more about so that we can use cobordism to learn about it. So I said that um, you know we can have stuff cobordism if we have important stuff. Um, just actually, so I'm going to define these groups and then I'm going to make the, say the note in a second. Okay, so we're going to define the group omega n, and this as a set is going to be uh, cobordism classes. of uh, closed n-manifolds. Um, no, not as far as I know. Any relation to the loop space? I don't think this, no, no. Just, it's just the same notation. Yeah, that, that's pretty much the answer. Um, and, uh, so this is cobordism classes of closed n-manifolds, and this has an operation, which you've actually already seen over here, which is that we can take m plus n, and this is just disjoint union. And then uh, this is a group, and the identity is the class of the empty manifold. We can, the empty manifold in this particular context, this is the only context in which I know this, the empty manifold is of every dimension. Usually it's of dimension like negative one. This time it's any dimension that you like. Um, and uh, for the inverse, and this, this depends. And in the case of it depends very strongly on the stuff. So if, with example, with, with none, so the unoriented cobordism, which is really where we've been working so far, um, is just m itself. Because m plus m is m disjoint union m, which is the empty set. On the other hand, if we have orientation, then we need m plus m with the reverse orientation, and this is going to be the empty set. And then if you need more stuff, you're going to need more information about exactly how you do things. But the goal is to be able to put enough, to change the data on m in such a way that you can glue it together into a cylinder like, you know, that's facing down appropriately. So that's what's going on there. Yes? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think pretty much if you, if you can't construct something like this, then you're doing it wrong. Um, OK. Moreover, uh, and we're not going to come back to this in this lecture, but it'll be important later. If we add all of them up, this is a ring. And you just define the product to be the Cartesian product. And as an exercise, you might want to check that this is actually well defined. That if you change the representatives for one of these, you get something which is in the, you know, that this is a well defined operation. But it is. You can trust me. Or maybe not, but you should trust me on this. Um, and it gives you a ring. Yes? I don't want to get into a fight with Peter, so I'm just going to pass on that. What, what uh, never mind. <laughs> um, 
Um, so, uh, okay. So, what we're going to do today, so in fact, I'm going to be telling you that things are isomorphic as groups today, but they're in fact isomorphic as rings. We don't have time to get into it, but everything is going to be isomorphic as rings, even though we're only going to be proving it as groups. They're in fact going to be isomorphic as graded rings, but we're only going to be proving it for groups. Um, uh, yes. Um, right. And all of the empty sets are glued together. <laughs> because it's really the same manifold. Anyway, that part is a bit meh. But once you put it together all into one, it actually makes sense. Because your zero has grading zero. And that's what it should have. So this actually makes more sense as a graded ring than as other things. But anyway. Um, OK, so there it is. OK, so what might we want to learn about? Well, if we're topologists, we might want to learn about the stable homotopy groups of spheres, because that's pretty much always the answer. So today, we're going to be relating cobordism to <laughs> I'm pretending to be a I know it's on video. It's going to be recorded forever. And then, you know, in 10 years where I'm grumbling about stable homotopy groups of spheres somewhere, people will play the video back at me. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> if I'm important enough to be made fun of by Jon Stewart, I'll take that. Um, but uh, so. So we're going to do this to, do, to talk about stable homotopy groups of spheres. But uh, unfortunately, if we're doing just plain oriented cobordism, which you think might be the thing that you want to work with, uh, it won't give you stable homotopy groups of spheres. Next time, we're going to talk about what it does give you. But today, if we want to get down to just stable homotopy groups of spheres, we're going to need to add stuff. So definition. A framing of an n manifold M is an embedding of M into R n plus k for some k together with a trivialization. of the normal bundle. So a couple, of, a couple of notes about this. Sometimes people will say it's a trivialization of the stable tangent bundle, of a stabilization of the tangent bundle. This is the same thing. However, sometimes when by framing people will mean a, a trivialization of the tangent bundle, and then it's a completely different thing. So with cobordism, the general rule of thumb is that you are always putting foo structure on the normal bundle, not on the tangent bundle. And later, I don't think we're talking about complex cobordism here, but if you talk about complex cobordism, you notice you can't put a complex structure on the tangent bundle of both an n manifold and an n plus 1 manifold. And in a cobordism, you have both. You have w as an n plus 1 manifold. So something is, is being funny, and the funniness comes from the, the fact that you're always working with the normal bundle. So that's an important note. And just as uh, where does stability come in? Well, this is sort of the first place you see it. Whenever you, don't, whenever you have an embedding of m into rn plus k, you always also have an embedding into rn plus k plus l just by ignoring the last bunch of coordinates. And a trivialization on the normal bundle here gives you a trivialization on the normal bundle here just by making the bundle normal, you know, the, you, taking the usual basis on the last L coordinates. So somehow a framing is only well defined up to adding a bunch of extra variables at the end, and that's where your stability will come from. Yes?
that letter continue because the relationship with her work is the point, and so she should explicitly yeah. answer your question in the course of the day. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's if, if I don't answer your question by the end, ask me again and I will answer it. Okay. So this is sort of where, where stability comes from, morally speaking and actually speaking. And just as another note, um, if this is just a notational thing, but it'll be more useful later, and I, so I want to mention it now. If new is the normal bundle, so we have new is the normal bundle on M, then we can map M to a point and take the trivial bundle on a point. And a trivialization is, so, so the trivialization is generally called B. Uh, and uh, then the idea is that B makes this into a pullback square. That's the same as choosing a trivialization. Um, and that's just a useful thing that we'll, we'll write that down again later. So I wanted to say it now when it first came up. Okay. So now we're doing framed cobordism. And now we need to know what kind of data we need on the manifold W. So these are framed cobordant. So this is a manifold M with the trivialization B. So this is two framed manifolds. And this is, uh, I'll call it M prime with a trivialization B prime. These are framed cobordant. If there exists a framed manifold, so what does it really mean for the framed manifold to work? Uh, where this is true and the framing on W restricts to the framings on M and n. So the framing on eep, w is going to uh, go into a, a space of one dimension higher so that we have the same dimension on the normal bundle. And then you need that to work properly. No, I still have half a board here. Good. So the way that we usually denote about the rings which version of cobordism we're talking about is we decorate the omega. So the framed cobordism ring is written this way. And the one remark I want to make here is that if there's nothing, if there's no decoration, that means we're oriented. And if instead of writing omega something, we write a big, weird, fancy n, this means unoriented. And you may ask, why an n? And I will tell you, I have no idea. I think it's an omega because it's oriented. I'm not certain. And n is because it's n-oriented. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, but that's what we're going to be talking about next time. But right now, we're talking about this. So the theorem, and this is the theorem of Pontryagin, I'm going to mess up the spelling of this. So as graded rings, the oriented cobordism ring is isomorphic to the stable homotopy groups of spheres. So just because we mentioned this one time yesterday and then never really went back to it, I'm going to remember, rec recall what these are so that you remember what I'm talking about. So pi m stable of spheres is the co-limit over all k of homotopy classes of maps of s m plus k into s k. And what? Uh, I like, I like uh, it's a good co-limit. Um, and then the way that you map them up is you say, 
you know, you need an inclusion from each k into k plus 1, and you just suspend the map. And if you think about it, if you're insane, like us, um, then you think of, so a smaller sphere sitting as the equator inside a bigger sphere, and the other part is adding another dimension. Like when you, add, when you go from Rn to Rn plus 1, you add another big dimension. When you go from Sn into Sn plus 1, you add another big dimension, but it's all smushed together into this one point. Um, and that, that's really what's going on here. If you have a map from Rm plus k into Rk, you can automatically get a map from Rm plus k plus 1 into m plus k plus, into Rk plus 1 just by ignoring the last coordinate and doing nothing to it. So that's really what's going on in this colimit. It just happens to be that all the infinite parts are smushed together. Okay. Okay, so the goal for today is to prove this theorem. And as I said, we're ignoring the ring structure. So for the proof, we're going to show that the m-dimensional part is the same as the m-dimensional part. Either way, I'm, at some point, I'm going to start forgetting to write this S0. Anytime I write a pi stuff without anything after it, it's always S0. Question? OK, so. So what it, OK, fine. So if you are going, willing to, to take the Freudenthal suspension theorem into account, and that's perfectly good enough, take a really big k. And you don't even really need to remember how big the k is. It just needs to be pretty big compared to m. And then you just take that group. And then the point is that if k is big compared to m, if you need to make it bigger, it doesn't change the group. Um, um, yeah? Uh, good question, and I'm going to completely ignore it. Um, I'm sorry. I, it, it's interesting, and it's a very good question. And uh, it'll, the short answer is composition. The long answer is actually checking stuff, and you can go and look it up or check it yourself. But the short answer is composition. But this is one of the reasons why we are not proving anything about the ring structure. We are only proving it as graded groups. Okay. Okay. So. So the question really is, how do you get to homotopy groups of spheres? Because just from a uh, manifold, it's not very clear how do you get to homotopy groups of spheres. So what I'm going to describe for you right now is generally called the Pontrag and Tom construction. I'm mentioning this name. I'm going to do it in more detail next time. And I'm going to define generalizations of almost everything that I'm about to do next time. But I want you to see it in a very specific case today so that you have a better handle on what we're doing tomorrow morning when we do it in more generality. OK, so what is a pair MB? Well, it's just written over there. We have an embedding, which is not part of the notation, but it's there, from M into R and M plus K. And then this gives us a normal bundle new. And then we have this commutative square that I drew over there. And that is the map B. So that's already a good sign. We have this m plus k here. We have this m plus k here. It's a good start. So uh, what can you do with this? Well, this is an embedding. And there's a theorem called the tubular neighborhood theorem, which uh, there's two forms of it that 
I am going to write down, and they are completely equivalent. So the first one is there exists an embedding. So I'll give this a name. This is Yoda. There's an embedding uh, of nu into R m plus k such that its restriction to the zero section is Yoda. So you can embed the whole normal bundle into Rn plus k uh, in such a way that it sort of fattens up this thing. And the second form is there exists a neighborhood uh, of m in R with a projection to m. that makes it into a disk bundle. Um, exactly the same thing. Or n plus k, n plus k, thank you. I mean, in, in there, where, where it's sitting. Where it's sitting. So regardless, there is a way to fatten up M in such a way that it kind of, it looks like the normal bundle is sitting in there with it. I mean, the only picture, yeah, the only picture of this I can draw. He he did, but you have an embedding and you make a little neighborhood like that. There we go, tubular neighborhood. Woohoo! Um, by the way, this talk, the reason I said at the beginning of this talk isn't actually completely different is because a bunch of the things that we talked about earlier are just going to come back right now. Um, okay. So, um, whatever, whichever version you take, I'm going to call E the neighborhood of M. And a good, it, E is a good name for it because it's really an embedding of the normal bundle. So, it is a bundle over M. Okay. So there it is, it's a picture. And now we need to construct a map from S M plus K into S K. Yes? Uh, uh, no, the neighborhood. It is the neighborhood. Um, Yeah, in the normal, yes. Um, okay, you're right. So, so we have an Rm plus k around already, and that's a good start. So what can we do with this Rm plus k? Well, we can collapse it to, so what we're going to do is we're going to say all we care about is what's inside this neighborhood. We don't care about anything outside this neighborhood. So we're going to collapse it, collapse everything outside of E to a point. Now E's neighborhood, so it's open, so it's fine. We're this is a closed set. We're collapsing it to a point. Um, and now notice that this is the same. We can take the one-point compactification of Rm plus k, and that's Sm plus k. So this is the same as Sm plus k mod Sm plus k minus E. And we have a map from Sm plus k into here, which is just the collapse map. So we have a map from here into here. And OK, well, what do we do with that? Well. This is also the same as nu minus the, or actually I will not do nu, I'll do the boundary of E first. This is the same as E modulo the boundary of E by excision type argument. And this is the same as the unit disk bundle in nu modulo its boundary. 
So you take the Newton disk bundle, you have the unit sphere bundle, you collapse the unit sphere bundle to a single point. Okay, and now we come back to this square. One way we can think about what is the unit disk bundle is it's the image, pre-image of the di unit disk in here. This is just RK. It has a unit disk. So we can take the, the pullback of that, the pre-image of that here, and that'll give us a unit disk bundle in here, even though we don't actually, we don't want to choose a metric or anything. There's our unit disk bundle. So, and if we collapse everything outside of that unit disk to a point, we get a map. So we get a map from here to the unit disk in epsilon k modulo sk minus 1, its boundary, which is sk. So the important map is this one. Now, what we did is we took the data of this framed manifold and we turned it into a map from Sm plus k into Sk. And now we want to say, actually, this gives a map between rings. It gives us a map between these. So, I mean, it gets a map into here just fine, because if you just get a map, you can also get a homotopy class of a map. So the big question is, why does framed cobordism not change the homotopy type of the map? And a secondary question, if you actually want to be rigorous about it, is it, we, you know, we had this m plus k that we chose. You know, how, what if we had made the k bigger? And that's where the stability comes in. And I already told you that. So the big question here is, uh, what, what does cobordism do? Why does this work? I shouldn't write with chalk. I should write with marker. OK. So OK. So we have that map that we wrote down over there. And what we want to do is we now have two of them, right? We have a manifold M, B, and this produced some map. I don't know. I'll call it F from S M plus K into S K. I have another M prime B prime. And this produced another map F from S M plus K to S K. And notice, I never said that the Ks had to be the same. This is just two different cobordant framed manifolds. Um, and in the cobordism, really, you should be saying, oh, well, the K doesn't matter. You can always make it bigger. You can't necessarily make it smaller, but you can always make it bigger. Yes, yeah, our F prime. Thank you. Um, so we have these two different maps, and we have a cobordism between them. Well, we have a framed cobordism, which is W M M prime G, where G is this trivialization. So the idea is this is a trivialization on the normal bundle of W that restricts to B and B prime on M and M prime, respectively. OK. So let's see what happens. We have, so F is a tubular neighborhood inside R to the M plus K plus 1 of W. And then we do the same kind of thing. And we get the following diagram. So I'm going to draw one of those maps, one of these maps along the top of the diagram. We have S m plus k going to 
R m plus k mod R m plus k minus e, and this goes to S k. We have, this is, oh, I didn't name that map. This map is, yeah. So I'm going to call this map T of B because it's constructed by looking at this map here, right? That was how we constructed this bottom map here. Um, and you will see tomorrow why it's called T of B. Uh, right now, I'm writing down the trivialization of M. I'm going to draw. We have R M plus K mod R M plus K minus E prime. That's the tubular neighborhood of M prime. And this is T of B prime. Now, uh, I'm going to, well, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm just going to write this down, and then I'm going to tell you this. I am thinking of this as r to the m plus k plus 1. w is sitting in there. It is never hitting the point at infinity here. So you might as well think of it as r to the m plus k plus 1, so that we have an embedding of w, so the, uh, we have an embedding of w in here, and this is where, and the, tri the trivialized normal bundle lives in here. And F sits inside here. Because if you don't hit a point, you know, you might as well be living in there. And this goes to R M plus K plus 1 mod R M plus K plus 1 minus F. And this process gives us a map there. This includes into here as the identity cross 0. This includes into here as the identity cross 1. The fact that this diagram commutes is exactly the condition that we said that the framings restrict to the framings on M and the framings on N. That's what's going on there. That when you, restrict, when you go here, that's the same as going here. And when you restrict to here, that's the same as going here. That is exactly what it means. So in fact, in some places, they will write that down as the definition of what the framed cobordism does. And now you say, hey, this is the map we produced there. This is the map we produced there. And it also conveniently, as I'm going to erase this, we have this SM plus K cross I that lives in there. And these factor through that. And what we want is we wanted to show that these, that a cobordism, framed cobordism between manifolds gives you a homotopy between the maps that they produce. And there it is. There's your homotopy. Um, and so there. So what this means is that we get a well-defined map in this direction. We don't know it's an isomorphism. We don't know it's surjective. We don't know anything. What we know is that we get a map from here to here. I didn't need to worry about homotopies yet, because homotopy is just quotient out. So it might be that homotopy is that there's no map in the other direction, but that doesn't affect the map in this direction. So now we're going to construct the map in the other direction. And what do I want to erase other than nothing? I'm going to assume you guys remember that there. Oh, no, I have another board. Woohoo! This makes life easier. Um, this is what I want to erase. Um, so now we need to take a class in the stable homotopy groups of spheres, and we need, again, I keep reaching for the chalk, uh, and we need to produce uh, a framed manifold. So I didn't give you any examples of framed manifolds. I just said, this is a framed manifold. Maybe there are none. 
maybe it's just, you know, nonsense. And I've just been doing nonsense, and I've shown there's a map from the empty set into here, which honestly, there are much easier ways of doing. And so let's take, get an example of a framed manifold. So I'm going to take a map from Rm plus k into Rk. And we have 0, which lives in here. And uh, I'm going to assume that 0 is a regular value of f. So f is differentiable. So now, this has a nice trivial bundle. We know what it is. And now I'm going to take f inverse of 0. And this is an m manifold. And it's framed. And I'm just going to tell you that this is an example because we don't have very much time left. But it works. And you should actually just be able to check that it works. But this is actually a special case of a really important notion of Tom's called transversality. We're going to talk about it a bit more next time. But the idea is if you have maps between manifolds, like if you take the pre-image of things, of a manif sub-manifold, you don't always get a manifold. But sometimes you do. And when is this sometimes? And the answer is transversality, transversality, the homotope things so that they work, and then transversality. So the important thing is that you can always homotope a map to make a particular point regular, or even more so to make it transverse to a given sub-manifold. So that's the important part. Your map might not be nice at the point where you want it to be nice, but you can always homotope it so that it is. Now, you can't, it's not always homotopic to a smooth map, but you can at least, assuming that your submanifold is a small enough dimension or large enough co-dimension, you can always homotope it so that the nastiness is away from that submanifold. That, that's the important moral. I mean, honestly, this entire paper of Tom's is awesome, and you should learn French and read it. Um, or even better, learn French, translate it for everyone else. Yeah, is it translated? I could never find a translation. OK, go read the translation. Anyway, the paper is awesome. Like, it's a huge paper, but I don't think any part of it is not awesome, which is pretty cool. Um, that book. Uh, you should, um, there's a website that I shouldn't advertise to you on video that probably has that book. Um, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so now we want to take, go the other way. Let's take a homotopy class of maps here and get a framed manifold out of it. And there's a couple of things. Um, we're really living in here, right? So we don't know what k we're at. But every element in here has a representative for some k. So you take your element, and you pick your k, and you're like, that's the one I want. So we have a g, a map from s m plus k to s k. And you know, I've been thinking about s k as really r k with all the infinite parts smushed down. And you can keep thinking about it that way. So 0 lives in here. And again, we can't assume g is smooth. But we can assume that it's smooth at 0. Not smooth, but 0 is regular. Um, because again, this is a pointed map. So infinite stuff only maps to infinite stuff. So this really is, honestly, a map from Rm plus k to Rk. Um, well, sort of. But near 0, it will be. Um, and as I said, you can homotope a map so that this works. So we start with a homotopy class of maps. We don't care about the particular representative that we take. And therefore, we can just assume that this is true, and Tom has handled everything for us, and it's fine. How do we get an m manifold out of this? We take g inverse of 0 is our manifold. And it comes with a framing. Yay. OK, so we have g inverse of 0 is our manifold with framing. So we've produced something in here. 
And now we need to check that it's well defined, meaning that if G and G prime are homotopic, then you get the same class of manifolds. You actually technically also need to check that changing the K doesn't matter. But notice that this is an M manifold, and that's in the, you know, the M comes from the element that you took, not, uh, not anything that you chose. So that part I'm just going to sweep under the rug. OK, so what happens, so if we have G is homotopic to G prime, want to get cobordant manifolds. OK, so what does that mean? It means we have a map H from S M plus K cross I into S K. And uh, zero lives in here. And so now we take h inverse of 0, and it comes with a framing. And uh, and so OK. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that this, that this works. This gives you the W. And the reason it gives you the W is because you know that at 0, it gives you, you know, the G inverse of 0. And at 1, it gives you G prime inverse of 0. And whatever happens in between, that's your cobordism. It's, it's a manifold. So it's an M plus 1 manifold. And you know what it looks like on the boundaries. And you know it looks correct on the boundaries, because that's what it means for it to be a homotopy. And the only thing you really need to check is that there's no other boundary, that there isn't anything funny going on. And that the framing you get is the same, but that just comes out of the way that you get this framing. You just write it down and it works. Um, but that just happens because smoothness, transversality, happiness, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's, that's what's going on there, and that's how you get the cobordism. So h inverse of 0, g inverse of 0, g prime inverse of 0 is the framed cobordism. So there's, yes? Does every manifold represent what? Yes, with framing, yes. Wait, no, not everything can be. The last part. Oh, yes. You can, you can check that. Yeah. Every framed manifold is, but not every manifold has. Yes, that's true. Has a framing. Um, so, and that's actually one of the things that really was why you need extra data to make stable homotopy groups of spheres rather than something else. Um, I think that was what I wanted to say. I wanted to make some remarks about the Ks, but I don't have time and you probably don't care. So uh, this, is, this is the story. I recommend if you want to know more about it, the details are all in there. And yeah, let's finish. Yeah, you just need Sard's theorem. For a point, it's just Sard's theorem. So in fact, uh, uh, Raniski calls uh, Tom's transversality theorem the Tom Sard transversality theorem, which I kind of find funny, but it's true. Other questions? Not, not that I know of. Somebody who's a different. 
Is frame manifold requires a choice of embedding, correct? You do because uh, you no. no? Are there questions? <laughs>